Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for your patience. Just uh, holding off a little bit while we're waiting for some uh, stragglers to come in. Um, okay, so welcome to our second week of our Cisco CCNA short course. Uh, today we are going to be covering uh, IP addressing version 4 and version 6. There's not an awful lot you need to know about uh, version 6 for the CCNA exam. It's really just uh, about the main guiding principles um, that uh, make it different from IPv4 and we'll have a look at those towards the end of the session. Uh, IPv4 is obviously very important so you're going to be doing things in the exam which will require you to actually place IP addresses on devices. Um, you'll need to obviously do some subnetting which is what the main focus of today's session is on. Um, uh, but you will need to do some lab work on assigning IP addresses. Um, later on in I think week or it is, so not ne next week, the week after. We'll also look at uh, access lists and uh, some of the things that we need to do with IP addresses in the context of access lists. Uh, so not much of V6, a little bit, probably 15 to 20 minutes today and the rest of the time will be taken up with IPv4. Um, we've got a fairly small group at the moment, um, so please don't hesitate as we're going through if you've got any questions just pop them through and I'll try to answer them as uh, as quickly as I can. Okay so IPv4 v6 um, using private and public addresses so uh, there's a couple of there's some different classes within the IPv4 address space some of those are used for uh, private and some of those are used for public addressing so we'll have a look at that. Uh, description of IPv6 addresses so what I mean by that is um, anycast addresses, unicast addresses, there's no such thing as broadcast in IPv6 so we'll have a look at that and also just how the addresses are actually made up, how the IPv6 DHCP and auto configuration features work um, just briefly and how it uses MAC addresses as part of the um, IP addressing structure. Okay, so IPv4, let's just jump straight into it. There's no easy way to get into subnetting. If you haven't done any subnetting before, uh, it can be quite overwhelming for a start, so I'd advise you to get as much practice as you can. I've got a number of resources up on the Moodle site, uh, which there's a couple in there, particularly the 3Com IP addressing one. I think it's the largest document. Uh, it's one of the best uh, learning to learn subnetting documents that I've seen in a very long time so have a look at that. It, it's not three, even though it's written by 3Com it's not 3Com specific so it just talks about IP addressing so uh, that's a really good one to look at and it's got bucket loads of examples to it that will help you um, understand IP addressing. As I said if you haven't done subnetting before it can be um, quite scary to look at for a start but we'll go through there's about four or five examples uh, a repetition and we'll have a look at these and hopefully you'll start to get a, a good idea of what's going on. Okay, I just had a question through, thank you from David. Uh, how much is IPv6 used in the field? Um, depends on where you are geographically. There's a bit of it in, in Southeast Asia and the States um, but at the moment not hugely used because it hasn't got a big deployment right across the internet. So. Um, obviously, you know, if you've got a small ISP or a small company with IPv6 connectivity, it's not much use um, unless you've got access to or connections to a lot of other places that have IPv6. So not a lot at the moment, but look, it's inevitable that it will be simply for the fact that the IPv4 addressing space is, um, is running out. Okay, so IPv4. It's one of the most valuable skills you can have as a networker. So in my... Um, opinion, uh, the OSI model and this are the two big things that you really need to nail to be successful as a networker. Um, now I know there's probably a lot of people out there that have done Microsoft certs, um, security certs, different sort of certifications. Um, the way that we do IP addressing and subnetting in, in networking or the way I do it in networking may be different to what you've seen through your Microsoft exam certifications, um, through you know if you've done CISSP or anything like that, maybe slightly different. Okay, so there's more than one way to skin a cat. Obviously, there's lots of different ways that you can um, come to the correct answer in subnetting. You've basically I'll show you a couple today. I'll show you the shortcuts that I use, the things that resonate and make sense with me. Um, they may make sense for you. They may not. Uh, if they don't, let me know, and we can try and discuss other techniques that you can use. 
Um, but you've, it all boils down to the end to you've, you've got to find a way that allows you to subnet quickly and efficiently. Okay? Now there's plenty of IP subnet calculators on the web now, um, little downloadable tools that you can use to help you. So you don't really need to remember everything, but we'll see shortly there's a, a big cheat sheet that I like to show people that, that gives you, you know, the, the basic ideas and you'll, you'll um, get things ticking over that way. Okay, as I said, it's tough to learn, but there are some tricks which we're going to go through. Um, and obviously the big thing is practice, practice, practice. So going back to last week when we talked about our study tips, just, you know, practice over and over again until, you know, you're completely sick of it. And then eventually um, you need to go back and practice some more, and then eventually you'll, um, you'll have it. And no, I still get it wrong pretty regularly. Um, so often in uh, this line of work, you know, you put under pressure, We've all got deadlines and you can start subnetting, drawing up a nice plan and then find that you've, you know, you've gone one too many bits with the subnet mask and everything's out the window. So you've got to go back and revisit it. So it, it's very easy to make a mistake. So you've just got to try and make sure that um, you understand all the underlying principles behind it, the binary math underneath it. And once you've got that, then you're less likely to make mistakes, but obviously it still happens. Okay, so the basics. Um, it's very good to have an understanding of binary math. Uh, I'm very serious about that. So it's not just um, you know a zero is off and a one is on type thing. You really need to understand, in particular with subnetting, the logical AND function. And we're going to have a look at that in a minute. And you'll see why throughout this lecture, why um, knowing what the AND function is all about is very important to good subnetting. Um, I'd probably expect that you'd already know um, binary math. It's um, obviously pretty common in the IT field and um, particularly if you've got a programming background or anything like that, you, you may know it more than others. Um, obviously there's some areas that don't use it too much, but you know, it's fairly straightforward. One is on, zero is out. Okay. So binary math primer. Um, okay, sorry, just a question from James. Do we need to know all the logic gates for subnets? No, no you don't. The only one you need to know really is AND, okay, and we'll, we'll have a look at that shortly. Okay, so the binary math primer. Um, zero or one, on or off, actually that should be off or on, other way around, obviously. Zero off, one is on. And sorry, a little slip of the tongue there, so don't, don't uh, slip the finger rather, so don't uh, get confused by that. One is always on, zero is always off. Um, each column represents a power of two, obviously, so in the decimal system, power of ten, binary system, power of two. And we read them the same way as we do a, a normal decimal number. So when you actually read them visually, uh, you can interpret them from left to right, but the values go from right to left. So the uh, least significant column, so LS, least significant column, is on the right. Hence, so your your columns are, the first column is 1s, 2s, 4s, 8s, 16s, 32s, 64s, so on and so forth. Now normally in um, subnetting we only use the first 8 bits and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but you know, the more you know, obviously it's fairly easy, we just double numbers as we go along. So just an example, if we look at the binary number 1010, that equates to the value 10 in decimal. And the way we get that, just in case you don't know, is that we have, if you look, 1010, so that equates to the first four columns, so we have 1, 8, we have no 4s, we have 1, 2, and we have no 1s. So that gives us an 8 and a 2, which gives us 10. Similarly, with 25 decimal, it's 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, okay, so we have 1, 1, 16, 1, 8, no 4, no 2, 1, 1. So it gives us a 25 decimal. Okay, back to IPv4. So IPv4 addresses are 32 bits in length in total, and they're divided into four 8-bit segments, which is called an octet. Okay, obviously 8 bits, octet. Okay. Generally, we will see them written in dotted decimal. That's the way we're all used to seeing them. Um, so, for example, 192.168.0.1 and 10.0.0.20, for example so on and so forth. Okay. Each number, each part of that dotted decimal, so the 192, the 168, the 0 and the 1, each one of those little segments is called an octet because in binary it's composed of eight binary bits and we can see that here in the breakdown here. 
So we've got 192 is 11000000. So that gives us in binary one in the 128 column, one in the 64 column, and then six zeros. So we have no 32s, no 16s, or 8s, or 4s, or 2s, or 1s. So we add those two up, and that gets us to our 192. Similarly, with our 168, 10101000, and we see the values of the columns here. So we have a 128, a 32, and an 8. That adds up to our 168. And then our 0 with all zeros, and our 1, all zeros except for the last column, which is a 1. Okay, so reasonably straightforward to be able to convert from decimal to binary which is one of the key skills you need, particularly when you're learning subnetting, one of the key skills you need to understand how it is that we get an IP address, a subnet mask, and then bracket, break that down further into which network we've got and which IP address we've got. Okay, so um, this is a pretty important table to understand. And I will just open up, I think it's this one. Just open up this file for you. Okay, so this is pretty much a similar file. I'll just move this one out of the way for a minute and we'll have a look at the slide. Cancel that PDF. Okay, we'll just move that over there for a second. So if we look at this table here, um, we can see if we go down, just, just addressing each column as we move along, we have five classes of IP address. So class A, B, C and D and E. Okay, so class A, B and C are the IP addresses that everyone will be completely familiar with. I doubt whether any one of you has not at some stage seen an IP address for one of those classes. And we'll look at that in more detail in just a sec. The class D address range is used for multicast. Okay, and if we go across to the second last column here, we see that there's the starting address for multicast is 224.0.0.0 through to 239.255.255.255. Uh, if you ever see anything within that range, they are multicast addresses. Okay, so they're typically used for things like um, IPTV, uh, voice over IP, some applications within voice over IP, um, streaming video, streaming audio, those sort of things. Um, Multicasting as a whole subject is out of the scope of CCNA and that's probably a good thing because multicast routing is one of the more difficult things to firstly understand but then troubleshoot. Um, so we're probably not going to talk much about multicast at all for the rest of the course but it's just interesting to note that there is that class that does exist. And then we've got the class E reserved. These are basically experimental IP addresses. So. Um, although I think from memory some of them, some of those uh, address ranges in that class have actually been allocated uh, to service providers or to um, regional authorities. I'm not 100% sure about that but I think that's the case and that's simply because the IP version 4 uh, address space is starting to exhaust. Okay, so you won't see too much of DRE. Class A, B or C you will see bucket loads of. Now, the interesting things that you need to understand for the exam are these are these particular columns. So for instance, if we look at the second column, leading bits, okay, what does that actually mean? If I just grab my notepad and I bring it over here, we have a look at what that means. It says leading bits. So in all cases, this column is referring to the makeup of the first octet of the IP address. Okay, so as I said, um, so that say if we just write down an IP address 10.10.10.10. Okay, um, so that's your IP address. This leading bits column is talking about the binary structure of the first octet, which is this one here. Okay, that's that one there. So what they're saying is, for a class A network, the first number in the first octet will always be zero. Okay, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven X's, which could be one or zero, doesn't matter. And the next three octets, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's what they're saying. That's what that column's basically saying. We'll have one bit that's a zero, everything else with X's. Okay, so if we copy that and we paste that down here. That's the structure of a class B. Okay. 
That's what a class P address looks like. Whoop. So there, I so say that's our class P address. Yes, and that is a valid class B address. Okay, so then we look at class C. 10. Ah, get my mouse in the right spot. Okay, so that's what that's what that column is basically saying. So if you were to look at an IP address in binary and you saw that the first digit of the first octet is a zero, you would automatically know that it is a class A address. Similarly, if the first two numbers were one zero, you would automatically know it was a class B. If it was one one zero, you would automatically know it was a class C. If it was one 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 zero class D, and if it was all ones, the first four were all ones, you'd know it was class E. Now, as I said, you're not going to see class D or class E referenced in the exam, um, just for interest sake. But that's a really easy way. You may get a question which uh, gives you a string of binary digits and, and says what class is this IP address from. Okay, so that gives you the answer. Reasonably straightforward. Um, the zero just moves along and is replaced by a one. Okay. Right. So we'll just move that down and have a look at the rest of the table. So size of network number bit field. What does that mean? Okay. There's a thing called a default subnet mask. Okay. So the default subnet mask is relevant to a particular class. So for instance, the default subnet mask for a class A network is a what's called a slash eight in slash in slash notation. And what that means is there are eight bits in the subnet mask. Now the subnet mask is used to distinguish between the network component of the IP address and the host part. And we'll have a look at that in a, in a second. But basically what that means is with a sl 8 bits in the uh, subnet mask is that it looks like this in binary. Okay, that's your binary subnet mask which equates to 255.0.0.0 in decimal. Of course remembering that we've got 32 bits in our IP address if we're using the first 8 so these ones here, as our subnet mask, that then means we have this many here, or 24, to use for the number of hosts, okay, which is the size of rest bit field. So that's important because it gives us two things. One is the number of networks. Okay, so the number of networks is the number of subnets that we can have within a class A network. Now using a default subnet mask of 8 bits, we can have 2 to the 7 number of networks because remembering the first bit is always a 0 so we can't use that we can only use 7 of the 8 and that will give us 128 possible networks. When we look at how many valid addresses we can have per network we have 24 bits to play with so 2 to the 24 in binary gives us nearly 17 million hosts. So what's that, that's effectively saying we can have up to 128 networks using class AI IP addresses. Each of those networks can have up to 17, nearly 17 million hosts. Okay? Um, you would never use that. And the reason you would never use that is because if you remember back from last week, um, a subnet, a single subnet is a single broadcast domain. Um, if you had nearly 17 million hosts on a single broadcast domain, it would be amazing if your network would even work. There'd be so much noise and so much uh, garbage floating around that no, nothing would ever hear anything else. Um, and then the valid, these last two columns just indicate the last, uh, the, the, I'll get it out in a minute, the range of uh, valid addresses for that particular class. Okay. Now you can see it starts at zero. Um, starts at zero, okay, now zero, 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 many of you will know is refers to the default network, it refers to a default route, There's, in default routing we use zero dot zero dot zero dot zero to mean any IP address that we haven't have a specific match for in our routing table will use this route here, it's a default exit out of your network, okay, and the last address 127.255.255.255, okay, now similarly with class B, um, we have 16 bits 
for our number field, 16 bits for the rest of field. Here we can only use 14 bits. Why can we only use 14 bits? As we could only use 7 bits here, the reason is because of this structure here. If you look at this structure here with a class B address, the first two bits of that first octet will always be 1, 0. Therefore you can't use them yourself to manipulate your IP addresses. So you only get to use those IP, those octet, that, those X's there, okay, which gives you 14 bits to manipulate your IP address. So that's why we have the 2 to the 14. Okay, 2 to the 14. The reason we're using 2 is because it's a binary number system. So it can only be a value, each bit can only be a value of 0 or 1. So that's where the 2 comes from. The 14 comes from the fact that we can use 14 of those 16 bits for our number to, to manipulate our subnet mask. Okay, which means we can have up to 16,384 subnets for using a class B address with up to almost 66,000 hosts on each network. Same with class C, but in this case we're moving the subnet boundary for, for, um, further along. So in this case we use 24 bits as here, but remember the first three are always 110. We can't change that. So we only get to use, manipulate the last 21. But again, binary number system, 2 to the 21, gives us nearly 2 million networks with 256 valid addresses in each address space. Uh, for class A, I've just had a question, so I hope that helped to answer Adam's question. Um, Juan has sent in a question, for class A, why do we only have 2 to the 7 and not 2 to the 15? Um, because class A, the default subnet mask is only 8 bits. Okay, it's only 8 bits. And the reason we can only use 7 of those is because of that 0, that first bit in the octet will always be 0. Okay. So that hopefully that'll answer your question. Now, if we look at the start and finishing addresses, you can see they're obviously consecutive. But why is class A only from zero to one twenty seven in the first octet? You can see in the in the second, third, and fourth octet it goes from zero 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 through to two fifty five, two fifty five, two fifty five. Um, but the first octet only goes from zero to one twenty seven. And again, it's got to do with this bit here. Remember from our column weights, this bit here is worth 128. Okay, so we've got this column's worth 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128. Okay, so if our 128 column is always set to 1, then the value of our octet can never get above 127. It's as simple as that. It's simple binary mathematics. So the changing of the numbers from 0 all the way to 127 is only done by manipulating these 7 bits. Okay? We can't manipulate that bit. It's always going to be 1. It's always going to be 0. Therefore, we cannot have a value any more than 127. Similarly, if we look at class B, this is always going to be 1. Okay? So in a class B network, the first two bits of the first octet are always 1, 0. So the value is always going to be minimum of 128. Because we have no value for 64, okay, 128 plus 64 would give us 192, but we can never go that far. We can never reach that far. So the range for class Bs is 128 to 191 in the first octet. Every other octet can go to its highest level. Again, similarly with class C addresses, the first three digits are always 110. So if we look at that, if that was 1100000, then that number would be equate to 192 as we saw just in the previous address, uh, the previous slide. Okay, so the ranges for addresses for class C are 192 to 223. We don't have any 32s, so we can never get to 224. Okay, so that's that's a trick with that. Have a look at what those first couple of bits are. Okay, so we've got 10, we've got 0, 
one zero and one one zero, and that determines where the decimal numbers lie. Okay, so if we just move that in now, I just had a question from Grant. Uh, why is it that you would use a one seven two dot x dot x dot x slash twenty four subnet in the real world? Um, okay, great question. Uh, the reason is th these what we're talking about with this subnet mask now is a default subnet mask for the class. Okay, but you can use because of subnetting and supernetting, which we're going to look at shortly. You can use any subnet mask you like on any IP address. It doesn't matter. That's the way you break your networks down, your big address space down into smaller networks. So if, for instance, you are um, with an ISP and they gave you a, a range that was say 203.193.193.0 slash 24, so a class C network, you could then take that slash 24 network and you could use longer subnet masks, so a slash 25 or a slash 26 or a slash 27 and break that network down into smaller networks that you could then route around your network. And we'll have a look at that as we go through the um, go through the examples. Uh, and from Jeff, would a class A be a typical large network or a small network? Um, it can be either. It can be either. Um, it depends on, again, it depends on how you subnet it up. Um, if, if I understand your question correctly. It just depends on how you subnet it up. So, I mean, generally you don't like to have any more than about 250 odd hosts in a single network and that's because of broadcast traffic, uh, so you try to subnet it up. But it's quite possible that you could use a class A network within your net. And there's plenty of organisations in the world that actually own public class A IP addressing space, and they either sell off subnets to other places, or they um, they just use it to on different campuses, different floors, different levels, different you know uh, organisational units, whatever. Okay, now the only other thing I want to say on this slide is that 127.0.0.0 slash 8 is a special case. So you can see it's part of a class A addressing space. However, it's used as loopback on devices. And it's pretty much any device that's got an IP stack will use this as a, um, as a loopback. So if you were to go on your PC in a DOS prompt or whatever Mac call it, and you go ping 127.x.x.x, so anything, um, it will respond. It will always respond. Okay. Well, I'll put a caveat on that. It should always respond if the IP stack is correctly configured on your particular device. Okay. So if you if you can't ping 127.0.0. something um, or 127. something, then your IP stack is gone. Okay. It doesn't work. It you're not going to have any luck with it. Okay. RFC not in addresses. Okay, just before I go into this, a couple of questions. Why is a slash used and where is this in the IPv4 addressing? The slash, the slash notation is just a quick way for uh, noting what the subnet mask is. So if I do an example here, if we say 192.168.200.0 slash 24, that is quicker to write and easier to write than takes up less room than 200.0 subnet mask zero. Yeah. So that's all it is. So the slash notation is basically for every bit that you are using in the subnet mask. That's where you slash. So this indicates the not sorry. This indicates the number of bits that you are using in the subnet mask. So for instance, you could easily say 172.16.0.0 slash 12, okay, and that would equate to 172.16.0.0, okay, so that's all it is. It's just taking the number of bits that you use for the subnet mask and applying that to the IP just because it's quicker and easier to, to write. So it's just called slash notation. Um, um, you may see that in the exam, so you need to understand that um, you, you see, you need to understand what the difference is between a slash 12 and a slash 24. And all it really means is slash 12 means I'm using the first 12 bits of the subnet mask as my, oh, sorry, the first 12 bits of the subnet mask as my subnet mask. So in this case, that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, dot 1, 2, 3, 4. There's your 12 subnet masks. And then your host would be 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Dot one two three four five six seven eight. So that's all it means. That's where you get the slash twelve from because you're using those uh, those bits in your subnet mask. 
Okay, <laughs> nice one, Tim. Whose bright idea was it to waste an entire class A range on loopback? Um, no idea. Can't answer that question. But it's uh, yeah, it's a provocative thought you raise. Um, in hindsight, it seems like a big waste, absolutely, because we're obviously running out of it. Uh, IP addressing space. Um, obviously, years ago they they thought that we'd all get by with you know that many millions of IP addresses, whereas now, of course, you can get. Uh, she's got all these smart devices and, and phones and wow, there's bajillions of those that connect to the internet and they all need an IP address, otherwise things don't work. So, yeah, good question. Can't answer it, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, so RFC 1918, private IP addresses. So within the IP addressing space, which we've just had a quick look at, there are three ranges of IP addresses that are totally private. And what I mean by totally private is they cannot be routed out onto the public internet. So they are only used for addressing internal networks, so enterprise networks, home networks, you know, whatever. And you'll you'll notice you'll know some of these IP address ranges if you haven't come across them in your work. Um, for instance, if you go and buy a Soho wireless router, broadband router, when you plug it in, the inside IP address that you'll pick up off it through DHCP will, is usually a 192.168 address range or a 10 address range. And that's totally private, okay? Only in, in only inside, not readable on the public internet. And the three addresses are these: so 10.0.0.0 slash .0 .0 eight, okay? So that uses a subnet mask 255.0.0.0. And the valid IP addresses that you can use in that range are 10.0.0.1 through to 10.255.255.255. .255 .255. Secondly, there's a class B range as well, so there's one in each class, uh, 172.16.0.0.12, .0 .0 okay, so that's using 12 bits in the subnet mask, so that's at 255.240, subnet mask I had up before. Valid addresses go from 172.16, whatever, whatever, to 172.31.25.25. Okay, and we'll see a bit later on how this 16 to 31, how, the, how you work that out. Uh, why they put it in the middle of the block, uh, I don't know. Okay, not really sure about. The only thing I can think of is maybe they were allocating IP addresses and they'd got up to that point and then the RFC was written and they grabbed the next available block. Don't know. Bit odd, bit strange. Um, probably if you read the RFC, it might actually explain that. I don't know too many people who do that unless they suffer from insomnia or are studying for the CCI exam. Okay, and the third class is 192.168.0.0 slash 16, so that's using 16 bits in the subnet mask, so that equates to 255.255.0.0. And the valid addresses are 0 0.1 to 255.255. Okay, so if you see any IP addresses within those ranges, they are totally private. They cannot be routed directly out onto the public internet. The only way that you can get access to the public internet using those IP addresses is if you go through a router or a firewall or an F5 or some other such smart device that does NATing, network address translation, okay, from private to public address translation. And we'll have a look at that in week four, I think, week four or week five. We'll have a look at what NAT is. Okay, anything else is publicly routable. So any other address that doesn't fit into those three categories is publicly addressable and must be allocated by your ISP or some other regional authority like APNIC in Australia, ARIN, um, RIPE, whoever it is, okay, depending on your geographical area. Uh, you can't just grab someone, you can't just grab a public IP address, stick it on the internet connection, on your internet connection or your public or your BGP and send it out. Won't work. Well, it will work, <laughs> sort of, um, but it'll just create all sorts of problems and you'll have your ISP calling you up very shortly and saying, what the hell are you doing? Take that IP address off, please. Okay, uh, just to backtrack just a little bit, I just had a couple of questions. Um, ah, very good question, I like that one. Okay, so from first one from Peter, why 172.16.0.0 instead of 172.16.0.1? Um, good pickup, that's a typo. It is one the valid address. The addresses within the range are 
usable addresses start from dot one. So nice pickup, Pete. Good work. Um, and from Thomas, any reason why the start address is different? Okay, so we've just yep, yeah, I've just covered that. Sorry about that, guys. That is a typo. I'll fix it up before I upload the slides. And from Liam, what about the one six nine two fifty four addresses? Excellent, good stuff. Um, the one six nine two fifty four addresses are, are AP, what's called an AP IP A address, so automatic private internet protocol addressing. Um, and they're used by a number of different operating systems, um, most famously Windows. And what it's still it's still a public a considered public address as by the RFC. Um, however, it's another non-readable address space. Okay, so that's anything that starts with a one one six nine dot two fifty four will not be routed. And that's because it's set into the Windows operating system um, and some others to automatically allocate an IP address if your hosts are set to ask for an automatic address, so through DHCP or BootP or something, and there is not a DHCP or BootP server available. Okay, now the reason I haven't mentioned it is because it's not um, particularly, it's not tested in the CCNA, but nice pickup and good question, excellent question. Um, so it is used but it's not publicly routable, but it is still considered part of the public address space. Um, and yeah, question from Amir, is the loopback address also a private IP? Uh, yes it is, yeah that's not routable, on the, that's not actually routable off your host. So if you've got a lap, whatever device it is, you can't route 127 anywhere. It, it's only local to your particular host and uh, there's an analogy with that with the IPv6 that we'll see shortly. So thanks guys, great questions. Okay, IP version 4 components. All right, so we've sort of already covered this um, mostly. There's a host ID and the network ID, and the differentiation point between these two is the use of the subnet mask. Okay, and I think it's better probably if we just jump into the examples and you'll get a better idea of how it works. If you understand what that is anyway, it's best to jump into the examples. If you don't understand what this is anyway, the examples will help you anyway. Okay, just a quick one from Jeff. When choosing an IP address range for a small internal network, is there any good reason to use a class A, B, or C private IP range? Um, Jeff, it, it, as any good engineer knows, the answer is usually it depends. It depends on what your requirements are for that network. If you're talking about just a little home network and you've got five hosts, just use a class C. Um, if you've got, uh, you know, maybe a network with, say, 150 users, something like that, and you've got like a, um, and you want to have a wireless network and a voice network, then you might use a class B range and subnet that up, so you have a subnet for your voice, subnet for your wireless, maybe a subnet for users, maybe a subnet for printers, maybe a subnet for servers, that sort of thing. And obviously as you get bigger, as your enterprise gets bigger, you could potentially use a class A and subnet up further. Or if you're using private IP addressing, because there's a slash 6, like class A, class C, it's 192.168 slash 16, you can use anything in the last 16 bits for your host. So you could still use class C, 192.168, but you could then use that third octet and make the subnet mask larger and simply subnet up based on that third octet. Okay, so I hope that makes sense, um, but we'll see a better example of that as we go through the examples. So obviously this is where the binary math comes into it. So first example, 192.168.200.33 slash 24. Okay, from our previous slides, we now know that this is a class C address, yes? Because it starts with 192. So the first three bits are 110, we know that. Okay, they have to be 110, uh, and in this particular case they are, so we know it's a 192 address. So slash 24, so what are we going to look at? So our address, 192.168.200.33, what does a slash 24 mean? It means that our mask uses 24 bits. Okay, so the mask is 255.255.255.0. Each of those 255s is represented by 8 bits, 3 8s, 24, so we're using our 24-bit mask. Okay, we're just writing it as slash 24 because it's nice and quick and easy. So the question is, which part is the host ID 
and which part is the network ID. So which part of that address refers to the host, so the, say the PC that's got that IP address, and which part refers to the network that it's on. So if we think of the network that it's on as being equivalent to a street, so the street that you live in, okay, so in my instance, Station Street. The host ID is basically the number of the street that you live in. So in my case, 23, okay, 23 Station Street, okay, so that's what we're looking for. Um, and yes, thank you, Angela and Kane. Yes, that's right, Angela. Yep, okay, so I've got a couple of answers through, but I'm going to work through them anyway. But top marks, guys, elephant stamps for you guys, you've got the right answers. Okay, so the answer to the question, which we're all answering, which is really good, is our address in binary, 192.168.200.33, that's the way it looks in binary. Well, I hope that's right. I'm sure it is. And our subnet mask looks like that in binary. Now this is where the binary math comes into it. What we need to do is to perform a logical AND operation. Okay, a logical AND operation to be able to determine which part of our address is sub uh, is host ID and which part is network ID. Now if I just bring across my little notepad here for a minute and we get rid of our stuff there. How does an AND work? Okay, so if you're not sure how an AND works, the basic idea is that we have two columns in our AND, so we're going to, we're going to draw a truth table, have a truth table. It's what's called a truth table, so an AND truth table. So we have two columns, we have a zero and a one, because that's the only two values we can have. And then we have two rows. We have a zero, and guess what? We have a one, because that's the only two values we can have. Now with AND, and the logical AND operation says, anywhere there is a one, uh, sorry, anywhere there is a zero and a zero, the value is zero. Okay? Anywhere there is a 0 and a 1, the value is a 0. Anywhere the value is a 1 and a 0, which we've just done, is a 0. But anywhere we have a 1 compared to a 1, we put in a 1. Okay, so that's our truth table. Okay, and I'll just delete that one. That makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so these, this is our rows, this is our columns. If we have a 0 and a 0, it's a 0. A 0 and a 1, it's a 0. A 1 and a 0, because that's the same as the other one, it's a 0. And a 1 and a 1 is a 1. Okay, now that might not make a lot of sense to you at the moment, so let's have a look at how it works. So the result of the AND operation is thus. We are, we've got our address in binary, we have our subnet mask in binary. All computing devices, whether they're PCs, routers, whatever it is, will do this same logic operation. So we're going to, bit by bit, go through and use our AND logic to determine which part is a subnet mask and which part of that 192.168.200 is a network and which part is the actual host ID. So we go through and we compare the first bit. So 1 and 1, remembering from our truth table, I'll just bring it across here in the bottom corner here. So our truth table says 1 and 1 is a 1, okay, so that bit carries down. The 1 in the address, 1 of the subnet mask, again is a 1, so it carries down. Now we get to the part of the address where we have a 0, okay, so this is our 192 in, in binary. So the 0 and the 1, according to our truth table, is a 0. 0, 1, 0. 0 and 1 is 0. 0 and 1 is 0, and so on, for the first octet. So that shows that this subnet mask of 255, 255, 255, converted into binary, all it basically does is transposes the first part of the network address, the first part of the IP address, down to the bottom. So it's exactly the same, isn't it? That's 192, this is 192 down here as well. Similarly, down here, we're doing our bitwise operation, our ANDs, the top 
part of the IP address moves down to the bottom. So that doesn't change either. So it's 192168. Now remember the subnet mask determines what the subnet is. Um, the third address here, the third part of the octet is a 200, again all ones, so it just transposes down. Okay. The fourth part of the octet, with the subnet mask, it's all zeros. So as by our truth table, if you see a zero and a zero together, it simply creates a zero. So wherever we've got here, or a one and a zero, becomes a zero. So no matter what you've got in this octet here, in the host part, if there's a zero there, it rubs out. Okay, so in the end, convert it back into decibel, it reveals the network ID as 192.168.200.0. Okay, so that gives you what your network address is. And that's determined by the subnet mask. Subnet mask determines network ID. That then means that the last part of the address, the last octet, is the host ID, and that's 33. Okay, so now a number of people actually pop, pop that through as being answered, so all correct. Now, this is a long-winded way to do it. I fully acknowledge that. Um, this is time-consuming. It's important for you to understand how to do this, though. Um, if you're experienced with IP addressing, then we'll have a, there's quicker ways to do it. We'll have a look at that shortly. But if you're not experienced with it, you really need to understand what the binary math is for a start. And then once you've had more practice with this, it'll become second nature. You'll suddenly remember that, okay, slash 16 means 255, 255, that means the first two octets, we just let those through and the rest is a host. Okay, you'll be able to say that straight away. Until you understand that, it, it's quite difficult and it can be a little bit challenging. So that's why, so it is, it is getting a bit time consuming. So apologies for that, but you really need to understand this fairly strongly. Okay, so moving on. Network ID 192.168.200.0. How many hosts and what addresses are valid? Okay, so this is the second part of our question. And again, the first part, the first question we answered was, what's a network, what's a host? You will get, you may get that sort of question on the exam. This one, how many hosts and what addresses are valid? You will also get this sort of question as well. So the subnet mask in the example is slash 24, meaning that 8 bits are left for the host. Okay, so 24 bits for the subnet. 8 bits for the hosts. Okay, so now there's a quick way that we can work that out. So 8 bits left for the host gives us 256 addresses. Okay, and we know that because we know that 8 bits of binary give us numbers from 0 to 255, as I've got written there. So that effectively gives us 256 addresses, 0 to 255. But, however, the first and last addresses are not usable. Okay, why are they not usable? Because the first address is always used to designate the network. Okay, so that's the address that you put into your routers, or you know, while well, is used for routing or layer three switching, and it, it it just says this is the network address. Now you can't use that as a valid IP address host in this case. Okay, you can use subnet zero, what's called subnet zero. If you've got a large, a large subnet, a large what's called a supernet, but in this case, because it's a default mask, the starting address is zero. You can't use that as a valid address to a host. And the last address, 255, is a broadcast address. So that simply means that um, if you send a packet, try to send a packet to that address, it will effectively go to everything on that subnet. Okay, so it's a broadcast address. You can't use it as a host address. And that leaves us as dot one dot two fifty four as valid addresses. So the formula for how many hosts is fairly simple. It's two, because two binary number system, two n minus two, where n is the number of host bits. So in this case it's two to the power of eight, which equals two hundred and fifty six, minus two, which is two hundred and fifty four. So two hundred and fifty four valid addresses. Okay, going through another example. So 203.193.193.0 slash 25. We want to find the network, the broadcast address, and the valid host addresses. Okay, so we'll try and move through the, these examples fairly quickly. Ask questions as we go along. So the network address is easy. 
It's 203.193.193.0. Okay, how the heck did you work out that? Um, and we'll just go back for a second. The way I work that out is, if we look at, where's my notepad again? Get my notepad up here. And the reason it's easy will become evident hopefully now. Okay, so 203.193.0. I've just said I'm going to use 25 bits as my subnet mask. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Dot 1. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's what I'm going to use. That's basically what that's saying. 25 consecutive bits all set to 1 as my subnet mask. Now, that then equates to this in decimal. 255. Dot 255.255.128. Dot dot okay, because the one is in the 128 column. Now, as I said before, um, this is a long-winded way to do it. Now, I've said it's easy. Bang, there's a network address because I've done lots of it. Okay, and the same with you guys. There'll be plenty of you guys out there that'll have done plenty of this, and you can just bang. You, you understand what this is on about. What I'm saying about here. But for those of you who are not sure. This is the longhand way of doing it. Okay, so we've got 25 bits. This one here is 128. Therefore, if that bit is used for the subnet mask, okay, and we've only got seven bits to use for our hosts, then one of two things. Then this means one of two things. And this is, I'll give you a trick here. This is a trick for those, uh, a quick trick for working out how your subnets increment. Okay, so you can see the first three octets are 255. Now we don't care about those because they're nice and easy. We know that whatever number, whatever IP address number is relevant for that octet will just be passed through. So in this case, 203, if the mask is 255, then the address will just come down as 203. Similarly, the 193 will come down and the 193 will come down as from our binary AND operation just previously. In terms of the actual network address, 128 is a subnet mask. Okay. Now, using one bit in that octet, it can only be two values, can't it? It can only be a zero or a one. If it's a zero, the value is zero. If it's a one, the value is 128. It can't be anything else. It has to be a zero or a 128. So because of that, I already know that I've got dot zero slash twenty five there, so I know I must be talking about the zero address, the zero network, the zero subnet, because I can't be talking about the one twenty eight because there's only two values that it could be here, one or zero, so it can only be zero or one twenty eight. I've got zero, so I automatically know that that's a subnet mask. Oh, sorry, that's a network ID. So that's nice and easy. We can get that pretty pretty quickly. The broadcast is not so easy. So first of all, we have to convert the binary, find the next subnet, and the address just prior to that is a broadcast address. Okay, so what I'm saying there is, I've just explained that that can either be a zero or one, so it either must be zero or one twenty-eight. If we assume, so so that means the valid networks. Are 203.193.193.0 or 203.193.193.128. They are the valid networks, aren't they? Because this number here can only be a 1 or a 0. So the easiest and quickest way to work that out that I know of is to find out what the, now this is another trick for the subnet, for the, to work out what the network address is, is you remove all octets. Okay, remove all octets that have only ones in them, and you ignore those. You take your last octet here, however many bits you are using, convert that to a 1, so that gives you a value of 128, okay, in that octet. You then subtract that from 256. Okay, and 256 because that's how many values you can have in 8 bits, 0 to 54, and that yields 128. What that tells you is that your valid subnets will go up in increments of 128. Okay, 
So the first subnet is always zero, always starts at zero. If your subnet's then incrementing 128, then the next subnet will be 203.193.193.128. The next subnet would be 203.193.193.256. Oh, hang on a minute. You can't have more than 256. You can't have more than 255, can you? So there are only two valid subnets for that network, 0 and 128. So if we now know that 128 is the next valid network, then the broadcast address must be 203.193.127 because the broadcast address is always one less than the next available subnet. Okay? And if we look at that in binary, it works out this way. Okay, so you've got our address, 203.193.193.0. We've got our mask. Notice our 25th bit, so in green is your subnet mask. In red is the hosts. So this yields 203.193.128. So this is the next subnet, which we've just gone along with. The broadcast address is one less than the next subnet, which is 128. And so therefore, the broadcast address in question is 203.193.193.127. Okay. So that's your broadcast address. So, okay, what about the host addresses? Again, that's easy. Once you know what your... Subnet, mark, subnet addresses and you know what your broadcast address is, then the valid host addresses are just everything in between. So in this case, 203.193.193.1 to 203.193.193.126 inclusive. Okay? So I hope that makes sense. So this yields us 126 valid host addresses and we can prove that by using our formula from before. So the 2n minus 2, where n is the number of bits for hosts. So we know if we just switch back to this slide, we can see we've got 25 bits for network, and we've got the, what's in red, so the seven zeros for your hosts. So 2n is 2 to the 7 minus 2 equals 128 minus 2. That gives us 126 valid addresses. So we can use that to validate our binary map. Okay, so example three. This time we're going to go the other way. Okay, so instead of having a 25-bit mask, we're going to have a 23-bit mask. So I'm showing you how to do it in both ways. The process is exactly the same. So find the network, broadcast, and valid host addresses. So the network address is not as easy this time, okay, because the subnet mask is dipping into the third octet. It's not going forward, it's going backwards, okay? So in this case, this is where we want to use our binary to help us convert this. So if we look at this before, it's mostly similar before, but it's one big difference in that the subnet mask is going back the other way. So if we look at the address in binary, 203.1.0.1.0.0, and the mask 255.255.254, in this case, because we have seven ones, so we've got... Uh, we've got 23, so we've got 8 here in this octet, 8 here in this octet, 16, that leaves 7 in this octet. We're not using the ones column. The whole lot adds up to 255, but if we're not using the ones column, then it must be 254. And this yields us the IP address of 203.193.192.0. Okay? So that then, using your binary AND, gives us this here, 203.193.192.0 as a subnet. So the network address is there. So now, what is the broadcast address? To work that out, let's first work out the number of hosts we can have. So as before, 2n minus 2, where n is the number of bits for host. Now it's 9, because remember we're using 23 bits, 23 bits as we've got here for our network address, so that means there's 32 in total, there's got to be 9 for use of the hosts. So we add it up. 2 to the power of 9 minus 2 gives us 512 minus 2, gives us 510 valid host addresses. Clearly, they must start at 203.193.192.1, but where do they end? Easy, we just count on 512 addresses from this point. So, yeah, it's going to take a while. 
So we're going to skip it through. 203193192255. Is this the broadcast address? No, it's not the broadcast address. And that's because we've got our subnet moving backwards. Okay, so we've got 510 addresses we're going to use. If we stopped here, that would only be uh, 254. Okay, so we keep going through. Now, this brings up an interesting question which someone alluded to earlier. Is it 203193193.0? Okay, isn't this a subnet address? It is, but only if you've got a slash 24. If you have a slash 23 network, uh, subnet mask, then dot zero actually becomes a usable host address. Now you have to be careful with Cisco routers because you need to put in the command IP subnet zero before it'll recognize that as an address on the actual router itself. Um, but that is a valid host address with this subnet mask. So we keep counting our two, 510 addresses up. So the broadcast address becomes 203.193.193.255. Okay. So the network subnet is 192.0 slash 23. The broadcaster's address is 193.255. And everything in between is a valid host address. Everything. So 192.1 through to 193.254. So there you have it. Welcome to subnetting. <laughs> ah, so. I understand the brain hurts. It can hurt the brain if you're not used to it. So let's just do one more example. Try and clear up the procedure. And then it's just a matter of practice, practice, practice. Okay. So have a look at, um, as I said, the 3Com um, PDF that is on uh, the Moodle website. Have a look at that. That has got uh, bucket loads of examples in it. I'll also be putting up some practice questions in the next week or so for you to have a look at. Um, and again, they'll be similar things. So it's just it's just repetition. Um, now I've just got a question from Tim. Uh, basic math, but can you use a calculator in an exam? Uh, no, you cannot. So in the exam, what you'll get is a scratch pad or a piece of paper, or it could be a whiteboard, or it depends on the exam center you go to, um, and a and a pencil or a texter. What I advise you to do, so this is skipping ahead a bit to week six, but what I advise you to do is when you get into the exam is write down your, if you need it, I'm not saying you will, but if you need it, write down your and truth table, write down your column values for eight bits of binary, so write down 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, and then use, that tool, use those tools to help you work out the binary math if you need to. Now I would think that by the time you get through this, if you do sufficient repetition in the next few weeks, you'll get to the point where you won't need to do that for simple subnet masks like a slash 8, a slash 16 or a slash 24. Or maybe you know you know what a slash, th if you work in a provider, um, the service provider industry, you'll know all about slash 32s and slash 29s and, and so you should be right. Um, but if you need it, write down those tools. You have if you book your exam for 9 o'clock, um, you don't have to start at 9 o'clock. You can sit there for two hours if you want to, writing down all these notes on the bit of paper that they give you, um, and then start the exam and use those notes. You just can't take any notes in with you. You can make notes while you're in there. You just can't take any notes in with you. And conversely, on the way out, you can't take any notes with you. So on the way out. So you can't, you know, brain dump and then take it out with you. Even though we know that that happens, that shouldn't happen. Okay. So move on. Last example. And then we'll get into IPv6, which is probably going to hurt more. Okay, so let's look at an address. Say 10.20.30.156 slash 16. Now, two things you need to notice about this address is that one, it's a class A address, isn't it? Because it's 10. Okay, and we know that from 10, the first digit must be a zero of that first octet, and therefore, if the first digit is a zero, it must be a class A address. Okay, bingo. So we know that's a class A address. Slash 16. That means that I'm using a subnet mask with 16 bits in it. So 255.255.00. So that means I'm using a class B default subnet mask. What? Can you do that? Absolutely. You can do whatever you like. Those defaults are, as it says, just defaults, but you can use whatever you like to suit the need of your network. Okay, 
So moving on. What we need to work out is I want us to identify the subnet and host portions of that particular address. We need to work out how many valid host addresses there are and what the broadcast address is. Okay, so let's step through it. 10.20.30.156. Binary math time, just for the moment. Okay, 10.20.30.156. The mask, all ones, represents the subnet mask, so 16 bits. The red represents the host portion. Okay. If we do our binary AND, 0, 1 goes to 0, 0 and 1 gives us a 0, 0 and 1 gives us a 0, 0 and 1 gives us a 0, 1 and 1 gives us a 1, 0 and 1 gives us a 0, 1 and 1 gives us a 1, 0 and 1 gives us a 0. Okay, bingo. And you get the idea. So it becomes 10.20, but the last two in the subnet mask rub out whatever's here. So it becomes 10.20.0.0. Therefore, the network address is 10.20.0.0. Okay? And there are 16 bits, so the red bits, 16 bits are available for host addresses. Okay? So we've gone half and half, subnet mask, half subnet mask, half host addresses. So with 16 bits, we can work out the number of host addresses. Thus, so as before, 2n minus 2, 2 to the 16 minus 2 equals 65, 536 minus 2, that gives us 65,534 valid host addresses. Okay, and we saw that in the slide way back at the start. Okay, so we start at 10.20.0.1, clearly, and then we count forward 65,534. Yeah, pretty much. On second thoughts, let's just do it either way and we'll convert it to binary. Okay, so we know that there are 16 bits are involved for valid host addresses. And we know, or I hope we know, that this is separated into two octets. So like this, eight zeros dot eight zeros. If we change all the zeros to ones, we get 255.255, which just happens to be the broadcast address. So we know that the broadcast address now is 10.20.255.255. And we know the network address is 10.20.0.0. So that means that the valid hosts must simply be everything in between. So the network address, 10.20.00, slash 16. Broadcast, 10.20.255.255. And we have a maximum of 65,534 valid host addresses ranging from 10.20.0.1 to 10.20. What have I done there? 10.20. That should be 255. Dot 254. Why the heck I've got 10.20.30 there? I don't know. That's obviously a, a brain melt and a bit of a typo. So sorry about that, guys. I shall update that part of the slide too before I update it. So it is 10.20.255.254. So I warned you at the start that I make mistakes regularly. So that's, um, yeah, so the address range dot zero dot one to 255.254. Whew. <laughs> that, that's over. Okay, so finally. If that all seems confusing, check out the resources folder for further reading. Okay, check out the exercise sheets. So the exercise sheets there is in um, the three com IP addressing PDF, and also I'll put some more up for you over the next few days. Practice, practice, practice. Okay, there are bajillion um, websites that you can go to um, if you just do a Google search on subnet practice. There is lots and lots of stuff that you can get to practice your IP addressing. So if you don't, if you haven't had a lot of practice at it, I fully encourage you to go out and practice, 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 practice. Okay. And lastly, ask questions on the forum. Um, obviously, that's preferred so that everyone can benefit because you're, you're all probably, many of you, you will probably think of the same questions. Okay. So ask on the forums. So that's the IPv4 subnetting part. Okay. That's the real painful part. Now I just want to have probably it's only going to be about 10, 15 minutes um, on IPv6 and what you need to know the exam for the uh, for IPv6. Now just before I move on, I'll just uh, answer a couple of questions. Um, will we have to give the amount of valid host addresses in the exam like you do uh, do the mass? Okay, so from James, um, there may be questions, yes, where you'll be asked to give the valid host addresses, but in general what they will be 
is they will give you multiple choice questions. So they'll say, they'll give you a, um, an IP address, uh, a subnet and a mask, and they'll say what are the valid addresses for that particular subnet mask. Now what I'm saying is if, if you've done lots of practice on these sort of questions, you'll be able to go bang, that's the answer there. Okay, so they'll give, they'll, they'll give you, they might give you four, usually they give you four options. So they might say, for instance, 192.168.0.0/16. What are the valid addresses on that? So the answer is, you know, 192.168.0.1 to 192.168.255.254. That would be one of the options. And then they might have something like 192.168.1.1 to .128.254, something like that. So it may be within that same subnet, but it won't necessarily be the correct answer. Okay. So you, you won't have to, I wouldn't have thought you would actually have to do anything, in, do the maths in particular, but you'd have to have an understanding of the maths and be able to quickly do it in your head in order to get the correct answer, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, now from Wayne, even though that's, a, okay, the, so the previous one, even though it was a class B subnet, okay, so we're looking back at 10.20, if we just go back, sorry Wayne, I just missed that question. 10.20 and we're using a class B subnet. Is there a device network confusion with the leading bit being a class A? Uh, no, no there's not. Um, the subnet mask, uh, the default, as I said before, the subnet mask are default. Um, the default for class A is slash A, but you can use any number of subnet bits. You could use a slash 1 if you wanted to. That would be pretty crazy, but you could do that. Um, and no, there's no, no problem with doing that at all. That's no worries at all. So it's not going to create any confusion with your Device. Unless you're trying to do something totally illegal um, or totally ridiculous, then it may you may cause problems with your routing protocols, um, your access list, that sort of thing. But in terms of just bog standard IP address, no, no problem. Okay, so IP v6. So this is a whole different economy of scale. So IP v6 addresses are 128 bits long. Okay, so we've gone from 32 to 128 bits, so they're four times as long. Okay, so if you reckon subnetting was difficult in IPv4, IPv6 is just horrendous. Um, of course I say that having not done years and years of IPv6, so obviously if you've done years and years of it, it's probably okay, but I don't know too many people in that situation. Fortunately, you don't have to do IPv6 subnetting in any Cisco exam other than CCIE at the moment. Okay. Um, so moving on anyway, it's enough addresses for 10 to the power of 15 hosts. Now I don't even know what number that is, but that is massive. Okay, that's absolutely massive. So it's designed to give everything multiple addresses. So we're talking dishwashers, fridges, IP enabled vehicles, etc, etc, etc. Run away if you're a Luddite. Okay, if you don't like technology, IPv6 is not the one for you because it's going to enable pretty much everything to go on to the World Wide Web. Okay, advantages. Allegedly, easier address management and delegation. Okay, easy address auto configuration and we'll actually see how that works in a minute. Uh, it's got embedded IP security and it's optimized for routing. Okay, we're talking routers, uh, routing as in actual routers. So not routing as in, you know, we do it in our head. It's not easy for us, but it's easier for the machines. And the DAD feature, the duplicate address detection. So it's got some fairly sophisticated um, features built in that it will allow it to detect duplicate addresses from different sides of the globe very, very quickly. Okay. None of these in particular that you really need to know for the CCNA exam, it's just interesting to know. So the IPv6 notation, quickly. IPv6 addresses 128 bits expressed as 8 fields in 16-bit hex notation. Yes, hex. Okay, so we've just been talking about binary. Now you've got to, uh, you've now got to look at hex. Okay. So for example, that there is a valid IP6 address. Yuck. I don't know about you guys, but you know I'm quite used to looking at 192.168.0.1. Um, that's going to take a whole lot more time to get used to. The ours is that's ugly, exactly. 
So, but there are some shortcuts you can use. Now these you will need to have knowledge of for the CCNA exam because there may be questions on those. So you're allowed to remove some leading zeros. Okay. Also successive zeros may be omitted, but you can only do this once. Why? Don't ask me, I don't know, I don't understand. But it still makes it a lot better. So we go from here, so the leading zero, so in our first address we had 2031 colon 0000. So we can remove the three leading zeros and just compress that to one zero. And you can see we've done that here as well. One zero, one zero, we've taken the zero off the front of this, that's a zero, okay, everything else is there. And then successive zeros can be admitted. So you can see here we've got two lots of zeros together. Okay, we just take them out and we just have colon colon together. So now it becomes shorter. 2031 colon 0 colon 130F colon colon 9C0 blah 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 blah. Um, so yeah, so you can only remove it once. Now, I'm a goose. I said before I didn't know why. Of course I know why. Because if you don't, if you were to move it twice, how would you know what, where to put them back? Okay? You wouldn't know if there was, so for instance, if you had three successive zeros and you moved them all, bingo. Okay? Um, so in the end, it becomes more compressed and a little bit more manageable, but it's still, it's still fairly ugly. Um, ah, question, why isn't the first zero removed, the one before 130F? One, zero, because there's not two zeros in, there's not two um, zeros in a row there. Um, so that was from Craig. Uh, and, the, no, uh, and from Paul, uh, should there not be three colons between the F and the 9? No. No, you just remove it and there's just the dual columns. So you, only, you, re, you remove the zeros and you just put the columns together, but you remove everything else that's between. Okay, so it's like this. So we use first 64 bits as a network ID, okay, and this, this is true for all IP addresses, so this is how they work. So the first 64 bits are always for the network, okay, so obviously 2 to the 64, whatever the heck that is, that uh, gives you the number of networks you can use, and 2 to the 64, you can have that many hosts. Which means, of course, that you can only use the host part for your subnetting. So your subnet mask in IPv6, not that we need to know about it at the moment, but the, the subnet mask will always be a minimum of 64 bits long. Okay, last 64 bits for host. Okay. The network ID is assigned by randomly generated number. Can be, so one of these three methods. A randomly generated number a DHCP v6 uh, or an EUI 64 standard. Okay, and what that basically means is it takes the 48-bit MAC address of your actual um, network adapter and, it's, and it inserts FFFE into the middle of it. So it splits it into two blocks and two even blocks and it splits FFFE into the center. Okay, like that. Okay, Nick, 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 Nick. I'm just looking at your question. Have I got another? Did I miss something up there? Did I? Okay, no, I think I was right. I don't remember writing that. If I did, um, your question is two to the sixty-four. Shouldn't it be sixteen to sixty-four because of hex? Um, yeah, you're correct. Correct. Oh, I was back at the start. Yes. Okay. Yes, you're correct. It should be sixteen to sixty-four. Correct because we're hex. All right. Sorry about that. I'll update that one too. Wow, not having a good day today. Okay, so EUI 64 standard uses 48-bit MAC addresses and inserts FFFE in the middle. So like that. So if your MAC address is 009027-17FC0F, splits it into two lots of three and inserts FFFE into the middle. Okay? Excellent. So IPv six addresses come in three types. So they're unicast, which is the same as IPv4 unicast, one-to-one -one mapping. Multicast, same as with IP4, so it's one-to-many, but you have to tune in and listen to it. 
and any cast, which is one to many, but will go to the nearest member of that one to many group. So for instance, if you have a group of servers, which are, your, which are any cast servers, and again, this could be for streaming video or audio, audio or something like that, you may have them in different geographical areas, one in each different geographical area, um, and your hosts are set up to go to that unicast, uh, that anycast address, and it's just the closest one, the first one to respond, so it's a bit like DHCP, the first one to respond will be the one that it will connect to. Okay, so in for instance, you've got uh, three sites in different countries, so say England, France and Germany, um, and you've got a anycast server in each of those sites. If the one in England, for example, is not working, then uh, it gives the ability for those anycast clients to go to the ones in France or Germany um, without any problems, okay, without any changes to routing or anything. And lastly, there's no broadcast addresses, which is great. Okay, so our IPv6 scopes, okay, so we have three different scopes. We have a link local, a unique local, and a global. Okay, so let's look at the, what they are. So a global unicast address, or a GUA. So they're routable and reachable across the internet. Okay, they're IPv6 addresses for widespread generic use. They're structured as a hierarchy to allow address aggregation. Okay, so in other words, you know, that's your subnetting and supernetting, allow them to aggregate together. And they're identified by their three high-level bits set to 001. Okay, and so that's very similar to our address classes in IPv4, isn't it? In that you've got certain bits that are set to certain numbers. So a global unicast address will always be, always start with 2000. Okay, so if we look here, this is how it works. So we've got our network ID, which is the first 64 bits. Our host ID was the first 64 bits. Our global unicast address always has a start of 001. Always has a start of 001. The global prefix is 29 bits. Okay, so that points you in the geographical area. And then you have your SLA and your LAN. So again, 32 bits, 48 bits. Wow, you know, slash 32, slash 48 extra 16 bits, extra 16 bits. You can see it gets quite complex very, very quickly. Okay, I've just had a question from Mark. If the IPv6 net address is based on the MAC address, then won't, well, okay, yes. Actually, Shev, I think, brought that up. Um, I wrote the network address is generated by EUI64. That's, sorry, that's a host address. is done by EUI64 which answers Mark's question as well. So um, that would then, they, they obviously can't be all on a different network. They've all got to be on the same network, so it's a host address. So I'll fix that up for you too. Okay, so local unicast addresses. Unique local unicast addresses are analogous to private IPv4 addresses. For example, 10.1.1.254. Okay, so they're only local, locally available. They're used for local comms, so VPNs, um, across the WAN, but not public, and they're not routable on the internet. So again, same sort of thing with IPv4. If you want to route these addresses out on the internet, you would require IPv6 NAT. And again, this is our structure of a LUA, or a local unicast address. So 128 bits, first seven bits, 1111, 110, um, subnet ID, interface ID. Okay, so now remember, you don't need to know um, you don't have <laughs> Sam, thanks for that. You've just blown my mind with this IPv6, my head hurts. Um, I don't blame you. Uh, so bear in mind, you don't need to know all the structure of these IP addresses, and that's why I'm just sort of brushing over it. You just need to understand, you just need to understand that there is global unicast addresses and what they are, local unicast addresses and what they are, and link local unicast addresses. So you really just need to understand the classes. You don't need to worry about the subnets or the actual structure underneath. Okay, it's not important for the CCNA exam. So the link local unicast addresses. They are mandatory addresses that are used only for communicating between two IPv6 devices that are on the same link. Okay, so we're talking about back-to-back -back links or single switched links. Okay, so they are communicating on the same link. 
they're automatically assigned by the device devices as soon as IPv6 is enabled. Okay, so they're just point-to-point -point links basically. They're not routable, okay, so they're link specific only, and their first 10 bits are, are set in hex to FE80. Okay, so that's what it looks like there. So it's 1111111010, one, 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 zero, one, zero, the first 10 bits, the remaining 54 bits, and then your interface ID. Okay, which can be generated, as I said before, by auto configuration DHCP EUI64. Okay, that's all you really need to know. You don't need to know anything too much more than that. Okay, multicast addresses. IPv6 multicast addresses have an 8-bit prefix. So instead of being FF80, they look like FF00. Okay, so you need to know the different hex prefix for each of these. Okay, you need to know that. So if we look back here, global are 2000, okay, 2000 slash 3. Your link local are FD00. Your link local, uh, link local unicast are FE80. And your multicast are FF00. Okay, you need to know those particular bits. The second octet defines the lifetime and scope of the multicast address. So all that basically means is it decides how long that particular address exists for and how far it's allowed to propagate across the network. Okay, just key points you need to understand. And this is the way it looks. Okay, so the first eight bits, we know they're FF00. The next four bits are lifetime. The next four bits are scope. And the last 112 bits are, represent what the group ID is. Okay. So again, you don't necessarily have to know all of this, it's just for interest sake, and that's why I'm just sort of walking over it fairly quickly. So here's some of that in summary. Okay, so node local, same node, link local, all nodes on a link, node local for the same router, link local for all routers on a link, site local, all routers on the internet, and link local for a solicited node. So that's specifically, they're addresses that are specifically um, applicable for multicast. Okay. Auto configuration. So there's two main methods for auto configuration. So SLAAC or stateless address auto configuration. So for stateless auto uh, stateless address auto configuration, you must have at least one IPv6 router. Clearly, the router sends out a router advertisement. So this router advertisement basically tells the hosts that are on the link to configure themselves as per the SLAAC RFC, which is RFC 2462. The host uses the IPv6 network prefix that is advertised by the router. So whatever IPv6 address you have on the router, the host will take that same prefix and assume that it is on the same network. And then to create the host ID, it uses the EUI 64 that we talked about before. So remember inserting the FFFB, into the middle of the MAC address to get the rest of the IP address. And then there's DHCP version 6. Okay, so DHCP version 6 is similar in a lot of ways to v4. Um, it uses multicast though to find the DHCP service, so it doesn't use broadcasting, to find the DHCP service and acquire its address. Okay. It's similar to DHCP4 in that it uses well-known multicast addresses. It sends out link, local link requests for the address. So the solicit and advertise messages come backwards and forwards between the server and the, and the host. The DHCP server will respond. The host will then request, request address parameters from the server. So same sort of process. And then it will also use, it also allows the options as per DHCP v4. So you might use your options to, like for instance, in an IPv4 network, you might use your options to um, give it information about your call manager server or other PABX, should be generic here, um, other PABX server, um, media streaming, whatever the options are. There's DNS, you've got default routing, you've got all sorts of different options that you can send it. Okay? And they're basically the same, but expanded more in depth to v6. Again, you don't have to know all this detail, just that there is um, SLAAC 
and this DHCPv6. Okay, and the basic guts of how they work. So DHCPv6, very similar to DHCPv4. Auto configuration. Okay, uses a pre. You have to have one IPv6 router. Uses the prefix of the router. Inserts using EUI64 the host ID. Bingo. There's your IPv6 address. Wrap and run. Okay, that's pretty much it. Okay, so that is basically the end of today's lecture. Um, so it's been pretty heavy going, IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, as I said, there's not a lot you really know to know about IPv6 other than those basic uh, different classes of IPv6 addresses, uh, the auto configuration, the DHCPv6, and it would be really useful if you could memorize or get a good understanding of the different prefixes for the different types of addresses. Okay? And if you've got that, you're pretty much covered. For the, for the purpose of the CCA exam. In terms of IPv4, um, you will need to be able to uh, work out, know the different classes of addresses, so class A, B and C. Possibly not, possibly class D, although unlikely. Um, I would be very surprised if you got anything on class E. Uh, you will need to understand the default subnet mask for each of those classes. You will need to be able to work out um, how many hosts you have, valid host addresses you have for a given subnet, given subnet mask, so it could be anything, could be using a slash 24, a slash 16, a slash 12, whatever it is, you need to be able to work that out. And you need to be able to work out what the net, subnet is and what the broadcast address is for any networks. If you can do those three or four things, then you will be able to handle any specific questions in your CCNA exam. Remembering that it's not Necessarily, the question won't necessarily come in a form of here. Here is your IP address. Uh, what is the subnet? What is the broadcast address? What are the valid hosts? It may not come in that particular form. It may be here is a sub. Here is a subnet. Here is a mask. I need. We need three networks. Which each of those three networks have to have a minimum of 32 hosts on them. Maybe something like that. Okay, and then in multiple choice, they will give you what are the valid ranges of addresses you could use, and they will give you some options. Okay, if you can't do the basic binary math and don't understand how to do your subnetting in longhand, then you're going to find it very difficult to answer those questions quickly unless you take a blind stab in the dark at it. Okay, so you need to make sure that you understand the long form of it. Once you understand the long form of it, really, really easy. Okay, just before we finish off. Um, just some questions I will try to answer. Uh, will they ask about tunneling in IPv6 from Angela? Um, it is on the blueprint in a very small way. Um, my understanding is that it is not one of the testable domain, one of the testable um, pieces of knowledge. Though. It is on the blueprint, so I would encourage you to at least have a give it a cursory glance. But in terms of what's being tested at the moment, it's not testable. Okay, um, Pete from Peter, uh, can we have some practice questions similar to what we may see in the exam without breaking the rules? Absolutely, that's no problem at all. So as I said, in that 3Com PDF, there's a number of questions in that. Um, that will give you good practice, but I will also be posting some more practice questions up for you, and there'll be quite a few in the question bank for the exam in week six. Um, okay, will we have material to read about it uh, from Angela? Yes, there is reading material on this up on the Moodle site already, just some primers on IPv6 and also how to do some configurations. If you uh, were interested in purchasing the Cisco Labs that we talked about last week, you will find there's a couple of IPv6 labs in there that just ask you to basically um, put some IPv6 addresses onto the Cisco routers and configure some, basically configure IP, start IPv6 routing, which is extremely simple. Um, but even though the questions are very simple and the operations that you have to do are very simple, you still have to understand those different classes of IPv6. Okay, different types of addresses, because if you don't, you're going to look at the question and go, I don't even really understand what that address is. Okay, so you need to understand what we've covered here today, but not a lot. 
Okay, will the exam cover MUTs IPv6 to IPv4 or IPv4 to IPv6 natting? Uh, no, there won't be very much of that at all. In fact, I'd be surprised if there was probably any. Um, you, if you're extremely unlucky, you may get one question, but I'd be very surprised if you did. Um, IPv6 questions. Uh, the IPv6 question, that's from Peter. Um, you will get, you may get a couple of IPv6 questions, but again, it's just basically, you know, this this is the IPv6 address. Um, how is this been obtained? So you may look at it and go, oh, okay, I can see there's an EUI64 format in there. It was um, obtained by auto configuration. Okay, something like that. Or you may say, uh, is this a, a global unique uh, address? Is it a link local unicast? What is it? Okay, so and you'll you'll know that from looking at the prefix. Uh, for a new exam, is RIP version 1 or version 2 to be tested? No, RIP's actually gone. Okay, so that's from Clive. Uh, RIP is now gone off the exam. So you don't have to worry about that at all. Um, uh, Adam, is there a central page connected to the IT Master site that has all the links and PDFs you mentioned? Yes, there is. That's the Moodle site, so learn.itmasters.com.au. If you log in there, that has all the links to uh, the PDFs and the sites that I've been talking about through the lectures. Um, and last one, ah, just a moment, thank you, Tim. Um, the reminder that next week our MOOC on IP routing will be on Friday. Okay, so it's not uh, Wednesday next week, it's Friday, so that will be Friday, October the 4th at same time. Okay, so same time as what we're at, depending on where you are in the world, the same time as this lecture starts. So um, it won't be on Wednesday, it will be on Friday. Okay, so I've got a, also got a key uh, uh, question, when is IPv6 used? IPv6 is not hugely used at the moment. It is, I said this earlier in the lecture, it, it is used um, in some parts of Southeast Asia and the States and in some experimental research facilities at the moment, but it's not hugely deployed at the moment. And that is simply because um, if anyone who works for an ISP, if you work for an ISP, you already know this, but it is a massive undertaking to firstly get all your equipment upgraded so that they support IPv6, but then to be able to transition IP4 users, V4 users over to IPv6 is a massive, massive undertaking that can't be done quickly or easily. So even though you know, we are running out of IPv4 address spaces and IPv6 has been around for a while. Um, it is still going to be a while, in my opinion, before IPv6 becomes the main connection method and IPv4 dies off. Um, and hence, that, that's why there's not a lot of it tested on any of the Cisco exams at the moment, because it's not a huge worry just yet. But, you know, the longer, the more time you spend on it, um, getting a okay with it, the better you will be when it eventually comes in, okay? Um, and just a reminder, uh, next week will be Friday. So again, I've just had another question. Uh, Friday class next week, not Wednesday, okay? So until then, uh, have a look at our Moodle site. Have a look at the PDFs and in particular the three comma addressing PDF. Any questions you have, post to the forums. Um, I may be a little slower this week in answering, but I still will answer. Uh, so if you have any questions, once again, prefer you put them onto the forum. Okay. Um, until then, enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, good luck, and we will see you on Friday next week at 10 a.m. Thanks very much, guys. Bye.